All right, all right, all right. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Still have fun? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to get pumped up. And I mean real, and I mean real pumped up. Because, because this next speaker is one of the highest energy speakers you will ever hear. Every time I hear Alyssa speak, I'm just like, she's up there bouncing off the walls. She is like, she gets people pumped up. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Miss Alyssa Torres. Thank you very much for coming out. I, I think that you guys are freaking awesome. I think you're freaking awesome. Not just you, but I kind of have a bias for those of you that are in this room. I think it's incredible that you guys are spending your Saturday here learning and so important, right? We know that in the security field, if we don't continue to learn, we become extinct like the dinosaur that's on my slide. So I've spent a lot of time recently delving into memory forensics. I'm the co-author of the 5.6 class at SANS, but it is my passion. I spent a lot of time, uh, in particular, I, I think the last job I had, people didn't know I was researching memory forensics. I was totally supposed to be doing something else. I think like, don't tell them. Don't tell them. So uh, we're, we're here today. I know I had two different topics. I tried to resolve that, but you know, if you wanted to get the Plinko persistence, who, who saw that one? Plinko persistence? Uh, mechanisms? I, who saw it on the, on the board? That's what I was asking. I have uploaded that presentation because I've given it before. So at the end of my uh, slide deck here, I have my Dropbox, a bit of a link to my Dropbox, but I at least wanted to show you guys, so you're believers, that if you came for that, then you'll you'll get that one, and my cheat sheet for recall, uh, this presentation here. So I'll give you the bit.ly link. If you wanted to see the persistence mechanisms, which is a pretty badass presentation, today is going to be on recall, which is a pretty badass tool. So, any, everyone okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. So is, is anyone actually doing memory forensics who's in this room? It, oh, I see some hands. You don't want to raise them too high. I totally understand, because you're a little scared I'm going to call on you. I've been known to do that. Totally. Uh, holding people accountable. But you know it's growing as a technique? It's growing as an analysis technique in a lot of the certs. They're writing into, into their standard operating procedures. Memory forensics is just part of the deal. It's how they analyze potentially compromised machines. Nowadays, this is where we start, right? We start by either doing live memory analysis or we're dumping memory, bringing it back to our forensic workstation and analyzing it there. So recall actually allows us to do both of these things. That's why I'm so excited about it and tell you guys about it. And I'm going to do some demos. Michael's here. This is my good left arm. Yeah, he says that's easy stuff, that's easy stuff. All right, so we know that memory has an enormous amount of evidence, tons of artifacts up in there. It's not just for malware analysis. It can be for employee investigations, trying to figure out what your kids were doing on their computer. Totally, you can, you can use this for any type of use case. And we teach that in our class. We, we have people coming in there doing criminal investigations and they are applying these skills because are there additional copies of memory on the file system? Yeah, where, where can I find memory? Page file. Page file fragments of memory, yeah, yeah, whatever was in physical memory, they end up in a page file that's very fragmented. Hibernation file, I heard someone say. Freaking crash dump, right? Crash dump. So tons, I, my law enforcement friends are like, we don't collect memory. Ah, we don't collect memory, but sometimes they have to hit the hibernation file or the crash dump file to really get a view as to what was going on, to include encryption keys, right? Pulling the master key out, true crypts, uh, master key, and applying it to a true crypt volume. It's still in use today. So really exciting. The, the first bullet on my slide here is running processes. And yeah, that's pretty good, running processes. You can catch malware in action, but the really cool thing is, is terminating processes, giving a historical view of what was going on the machine prior to you arriving there. 
sometimes we're called by security analysts, you know, who are in incident response, maybe you're the tier two, tier three. They call you up, middle of the night, and say, hey, this machine was seen beaconing out to a bad domain, bad IP address, by the time you get there, do you think the connection is still going to be active? It will probably be a terminated connection, right? So memory analysis will allow us to get in there and see artifacts left behind because there was at some point a network connection that was established. Now it's terminated, we can still gain access to it. So I've convinced you, totally convinced you, this is worth your time. Before we enter in, I'm gonna show you some process listings and ask you to go ahead and uh, determine what evil looks like. Pick something out of a lineup, we'll say. I want to stress, you have to know normal in order to find evil. As a believer is not. Yeah, and I'm not saying, like I have Baidu antivirus running on my system. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yeah, people make fun of me. I mean, they made fun of me when I was the only one using Internet Explorer as well, way back in the day. So I have Baidu, and it's just for fun. It's totally fun. But do you think Baidu antivirus was different from Symantec? Do you think when you're looking at a process listing or loaded modules, do you think it looks different based on the antivirus you're running? Totally, totally. So you have to know your environment. You can know normal. You can know what processes are typical for Windows. Like anyone, look up in the middle there. Is this an XP system or is this this and beyond? And why? There's a few different reasons. People always come up with more than what I'm looking for. But tell me, this is process hacker shown in the middle. So process list as seen process hacker like process explorer. What do you guys think? What do you see? You're afraid. I knew you'd be afraid! <laughs> I totally knew it! Dude, the thing I see, let's see. Oh, uh, it's just sucking. Do you see this? When it knit? When it knit is the parent, or this and beyond is the parent of services and LSAS. Whereas if you're looking at old school, people typically say, well, you've never seen an XP system. That's what they tell me. I'm really young cats. Like, we don't even know what you're talking about when you say XP, but I know they're lying. So, in XP, those two services, those, those two processes are kicked off by one log on, right? So, just by looking at a process list, you should be able to determine ah, is this XP? Is this Vista? Does this look normal? And that's what we hope for you. Um, see, we have a blue poster uh, that's downloadable. This is a screenshot. Of the blue poster describes an SPC host. Is it okay to have more than one SPC host, or will we be looking at a system that's totally owned over here in the middle? Is that okay? You know it's okay. Yeah, because an SPC host is really a service host. There's tons of services you know, that kick off when a machine boots up. So I, I'm going to also throw in as a reference a PDF written by Jason Faust in it. Actually, uh, coincides with an at night presentation he gives, an hour and a half long. It explains in great detail, but uh, he kind of dumps down the Windows Internals book. But it's still pretty good detail. He explains what normal looks like and what each of the typical Windows processes does. Sometimes I'll carry this, I have a late single job interviews, and sometimes I'll carry this and cram right before I go in. I mean, I never really get asked what this process does or what that process does, but I totally feel ready. So I recommend this, the PDF. I'll give you the link, no doubt. So, but why are we here? I want to talk to you about recall. Anyone heard of recall before? Oh, the should go up. Recall is a fork of volatility. Uh, Michael Cohen had the technology preview branch of volatility. It was badass because it had the win PMEM. It gave volatility the live acquisition well, totally memory dumping tool. And when he forked off, he actually took that with him. And it's really exploded and added great functionality to his recall memory forensics framework. You might know that recall is also part of GER. Anyone know what GER stands for? Yay, Google Rapid Response, which is free and free incident response plus enterprise solution. If you can figure it out, right? <laughs> Has anyone stood it up in their library? Drop, drop. I know. <laughs> it's getting easier though. Right now, the doctor, this is boom. 
right? Boom, it loads the agents for you, you push out. So it's worth checking out. It's worth checking out. And at least playing around with it, because that's what all the smart people do. And I hear Google uses it internally. So um, recall is part of this. If you're doing live analysis via GERD, you're loading a new PMEM driver in order to gain access to live memory. So the benefits of doing live memory analysis. So what's the benefit of querying memory for a process list as opposed to relying on the operating system to report processes? What might be the problem? Yeah, rootkits. Rootkits are all about hiding things, right? So you can hide the network connections, you can hide the presence of registry keys and files in a directory, and hide the presence of processes from the operating system. So when we go in and we do live memory analysis, we actually get around the operating system and we get a more accurate view of what's going on in the system. So recalls and allow us to do this. There's the six-step process. I feel better now. We got a six-step process that we use. It's pretty much uh, what's taught in the digital friendly stride sands, but it's worked for me. If the first step doesn't work, I drop into the second step, I drop into the third step, and sometimes I'll actually mix it up, and I'll start with step three or step four. Yeah, I got buddies that start looking for code injection first, because oftentimes malware is doing just that. Not running is like evil.exe in the process list, that's the obvious, but code injection is just so prevalent now. So some of my buddies will start with that. So I'm going to be using this as a framework as we move through our analysis. I promise to take you through all six steps here. In the limited amount of time we have together. All right, so uh, difference in recall is you can drop into an interactive session. That's kind of cool because when you're in a session, things are cached, and that's all the next slide. You're all the way up there. Who's using volatility? Uh, so tell me what's missing here. You see the top? What's missing in that command? Yeah, you say in the profile, the image profile, is the, the image is there, process through that IMG, but it's the dash dash profile equals. Isn't that a pain to type that in? <laughs> like, I'm really pitching this to you. I'm not really selling you the tool, but I'm pointing out the differences. Recall accesses an online. It goes out there and grabs the profile from an online profile repository. People get really nervous about this <coughs> because they're like, well, that means I need internet access. True, that totally, I'm gonna need something to drink. <laughs> that totally means you do need internet, internet access. Is that a Diet Coke man? Doug, Doug! Diet Coke is not hydration. Oh, some people think it is. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, it is, it is, that is a concern, that your friends and organization has to have internet, internet access. So we can actually move the repository list up. And that takes care of that, right? We point our configuration file to use the local repository. Can we say that as a variable? Oh. Like the command line? Yeah. I have never played around with that. I've never played around with that. <laughs> it, it is. It is. So, um, thank you. Oh my gosh. Take your pick. You know, Jake hooked me up. I tried to call you. I know. When well, now you're first on this. They've been free on Good job, Jake. Hey, wait a second. So, you know what, I think because you're on the front of the workstation, you're running recall, it's the tilde dot recall RC file that you change. I don't think you can put it in the command line, but we're all set. Right on, thank you very much for the question. But it might be there, it might be there. So yeah, that's the cool thing. Um, once you're in this interactive shell, you can type in plugins dot tab. Another kind of neat thing is it will tell you all of the plugins, you know, the Axio parsing modules that are available for your specific image. You will not be shown a list of things that aren't going to work. So these are Windows specific, and all I had to do when I was in the interactive shell is plugins.tab, and boom, I got some. Cool, enough. That was awesome. But session hashing. Session hashing is enabled when I drop into an interactive session. So it starts keeping track of cool structures like KPG and all the process blocks. So the next time I run something, it's really fast. This is good, but if you're following along with me, if you're doing live analysis, tell me how session caching is not going to work well. Good. Yeah. It's going to be cached in memory, which is going to 
basically changing the original working. Exactly. Well, it's caching memory once you run the PS list. But what if something else launches while you're doing lab analysis? Exactly. So it's working on the cache. They totally fix this. They fix this. So now it's a transient cache and doing lab analysis. So it's a, it's a moving target. It's a moving target. So I know volatility is probably your favorite analysis tool. I want to take a moment to compare. Just taking a simple plugin like PS List. So I'm going to show you how volatility does it. I mean, we have something called the kernel, kernel debugger, the KDBG. Oh, man, uh, the kernel debugger we get a lot. Man. All right. So in order for volatility to actually walk the PS List, it's a, the PS List is actually a bunch of new process blocks that are linked together by pointers. In order for volatility to walk this list, it needs to spot the kernel debugger data block. So this is actually difficult when you're dealing with, say, an encrypted KDBG, right? Which operating system actually started encrypting the KDBG? It should be a question. Did you notice that when we moved from Windows 7 to Windows 8, volatility just kind of dropped off and it's in the loop? No. It's been trouble, any of you? For a while, we could not run PS List on Windows 8 memory images because they didn't figure out, so they didn't publicly release the decryption of the kernel debugging data block, which has the pointer, as you can see, the pointer to the active process head. And that's the awesome visual there as I'm walking the W linked list of the process blocks. All right, so you can see if I can't get one structure parsed, then I have. Uh, broken a lot of the plugins and volatility. We are not prone to that when we're running recall. Recall actually has five different methods in which it comes upon the PS list. You can think, okay, recall actually scans on the process block. It scans for the process, the system of the process block, and once it finds it, then it will start blocking the list. So it doesn't rely on the kernel debugging data block. It'll figure this stuff out in many different ways. You can force its hand so it mimics volatility, but realize when I'm running it full bore, it will go through all of the five options. So you'll get more than just what's in the double links list of processes. You're going to come away with something equivalent to a PS scan when you run a PS list in volatility. Make sense? I'm relying on you guys to bring the knowledge here. I know uh, there's some assumed knowledge. Oh, it's going to get worse. So here's PS scan. In recall, it has a little bit of an extra flavor there. You can see I've highlighted over the right hand side of my slide. There's an E and a P in each of the entries. The E means, hey, we found this in PS list. The P means we actually found a hit in PS list. Um, so if you see that, this, this is awesome because it shows you what might be notable, what might be terminated. You can quickly look for an exit time. Okay. I'll, I'll be explaining some of this output as we go. A lot of people are concerned when they're in an interactive session that they can't output to a file. You can. There's a problem syntax. Again, I'm providing a, a cheat sheet. We'll play around with this at home. Um, it's easy to download, and you too can play. You gonna do that? No. <laughs> he looks down and takes notes. I know that you're faking taking notes. I know you are. All right. So. Uh, you know what we're focused on is baseline, right? A lot of the tools that are coming into the instant response space are all about, like, hey, if you baseline, then we can detect deviations from baseline. That's what analysts do. That's what forensic examiners have done since the dawn of time, right? We're looking for artifacts that are left behind, say, by user activity, by malware. We emphasize baseline when we're talking about memory forensics as well. Again, if you know what normal looks like, that, that strange kernel module that's loaded on the system is going to pop out at you, and you're going to know it's rogue. That, again, is what we hope, and this can allow us to detect faster. And you know, bullets three and four actually speak to what's happening out in the industry today. A lot of C-level is actually like doing this move into response in-house. Let's build some in-house capabilities so we can get better at this, right? But it's not all at once. It's not full capability. And in many regards, I don't know, you might have one person who's part of the dedicated team and surge staff 
when you have a serious data breach. So what we are saying is if you get a good baseline, you are actually preparing yourself for the external support that you know is going to come in and look over your shoulder and look for your documentation. So baseline is really important. It will save you money in the back end if you fall into that category of needing external support. So this is what my system looks like. A good example of how I do kind of services. Everything that starts with BAV is by Dementivirus. If you came in uh, and looked at my process list, what? No, I'm letting you look at my process list. You would not know what these are, right? So I'm supposed to be pointing to BAV HM, BAV tray. All right, so I'm really knowing normal is about your environment or your system, uh, you know, and that requires time, looking at many images in your particular environment. So I actually invented a machine with XPatch. And you're wondering why it shows XPatch, because it's just an ad clicking piece of malware. I like XPatch because it infects the master boot record. And I had some techniques I wanted to employ in order to identify detect uh, infection of the master boot record. Pretty cool stuff. So that's what I'm going to be using here as we walk through the six-step process. There we go. So, huh. This is actually how it is. So this is just step by step uh, my process list. I want to point out what is SMSS? What can I use SMSS as a gauge for? It's at the top of the list. Just go with it. Yeah. Ooh, could have SQL. So this is session manager subsystem service, dude. It's like the first process in my process list. I'm going to go off the creation time here as like the last time the system rebooted. So that's, I mean, you'll see this popping up. Sometimes you'll see um, processes from a previous boot creep their way into your PSCN. And you need to find the active SMSS to figure out when the system wants to reboot it. All right, so the next one, the next. Key process. What is explore.exe indicative of? Nice. Someone actually logged on. So um, what I'm suggesting to you is a bit of timeline analysis because I have this in chronological order. I've actually taken the PS list and recall. I sent it. You remember the output equals, and I brought it into Excel, and so I can sort. So I just sort by creation time here, and that's what we get. Someone actually logged in. And I can follow the PIDs and parent PIDs and do that type of a hierarchical analysis. So, oh, things to look for. Session. As of Vista, we actually have um, this, a bit of a delineation between system processes and user sessions. So the system uh, processes are going to be broken in session zero, and a user session is going to be subsequently. One user logs in at session one, another user logs in at session two, you got the idea. So that's important, and I'm going to ask you to take a look at this and tell me what's wrong. Now that we've gone over the basics, we got a serious issue here, I output this. Where do you see? This one's really obvious, so don't you think it's too deep. Yes, Explorer is running twice, which is okay, right? What makes me think this is not okay that I have two explorers in my process list? Nice, he's holding up one. I have two explorers in session one. How many should I have? Yeah, right. So all of the processes associated with the user session, dude, they're in session one. There's only one explorer that should exist. Totally well, know that. We know that. So we've identified a rogue explorer. Which one would you go with as rogue? The second one. The second one. Yes, the second one. Now, what we know about the first explorer, it's actually an orphan process. So we don't expect to actually see in the PS list the parent pit of 196. So that's what that second column of numbers is. But the 2684 turns out to be as we're looking at it. Um, you know, it's an orphan too. So we don't really have deep analysis. We could probably do a PS scan, maybe come up with some of this stuff. But in the immediate PS list, we don't really have anything to go on as to who spawned what. Pretty interesting stuff. Good job. Well done, sir. That was awesome. Now 
Ah. All right, so can we detect this stuff with other tools? I mean, I kind of grew up on Redline. I didn't really tell you about me, but I used to work at Mandiant. It's like the Mandiant thing grew up in here. You know, I used to work at Mandiant, so I had some love for the Redline. Anyone use Redline for memory analysis? There's some hands going around. All right, all right. So I guess I'm up with the Redline. But, you know, I said, how, how am I to explore processes? So those are found, but I don't have any session information, so it's really hard for me to detect, to tell whether, do I have two sessions on that on the system? Because explore.exe, it's legit. Do you see the path there for explore? Both of them are running from Windows. Is that right? Explore, yeah, it's supposed to run from Windows. This is insanity, right? Both of them look legit. Another tool is not giving me enough detail for me to immediately pick it up and line up like we did with recall, like you can do with volatility. I'm not going to say you pass. So, good job, good job. Or, or, so the second step is doing a deeper analysis of the process. So, I don't really see anything interesting here. I took the pig of what we suspect is the road explorer, and I did, did a deal of this in that interactive session with recall. So pig without eight, do it, do it. All the DLLs look pretty legit. Just by eyeballing it. Not going in with any special knowledge, but if you continue to look down the way here, I have some networking DLLs that are being called. If I compare that to the normal explorer, those are there. Uh, so I'm not really finding anything, but that's okay. I mean, I got some other steps I can look through. And this one is just pure gold. Network connections is step three of doing our malware investigation. Step three, dude, we got net scan that we can output to a text file. Again, I opened it up in Excel. And I found, so remember that 4008 in this case, it's actually, wait, we can look at it. 2940. Let's see, I did some different screenshots. So the real one is 2940, and now I can see that 2940 has. Several connections, right? There's one that's established, and there's a couple that are closed. What is this indicative of? What do you think? Beginning. Yeah, so I have a um, uh, simple structure created in kernel memory that's indicative of a network connection. It, it's actually state changes to close. I get another one created, it's state changes to close, and I have another one created, it is still in the established. At the time the memory was dumped, it had an active TCP connection to this 204 dot uh, IP address. So I looked this thing up. I looked this thing up. Uh, Blue Coats actually said malicious outbound data, botnets. Yeah, this fits with what I would expect from an active infection with XCache. So we're only on step three, and boom! We found some pretty significant indicators. You know, we're all about collecting indicators. So, what are we going to do next? Come on. I got like half of the room filled with Mandiant people. Indicators are compromised scanning, right? Tempered by fire, near. That's what I am. <laughs> He's not laughing. Oh, All right. So, uh, step four is looking for signs of code injection. We can do this quite easily with malfinds. Uh, malfind actually pops and identifies one memory section, a memory range that was specified in that 2940. What, it was a rogue process in and of itself. It was kind of out there. Why would it have injected sections of memory? Would have injected code. Have you seen this before? It has additional functionality. is dropped on the machine. Dude, that additional functionality is not going to create another process. It's going to inject additional, well, in this case, I'm not saying that it starts with an MZ header, but additional shell code is being injected in the context of evil.exe. But that, that's okay. It's, Somewhat expected if you play around with the interpreter, and you're writing in the context of, say, explore.ac. When you add books exploitation modules, you are continuing to inject in that same process you're writing. It's pretty cool to look at. So that, that's what is expected there. Step five, you have to do this. Even if you think you have enough, you're going to look for signs of rootkit. Mm, I don't see anything here. But notes that if you're used to looking for this in volatility, we have the same plugins in recall. 
So I got SSCT, that's going to be looking through my system service descriptor table, the pointer to the Windows functions, uh, call the product by my user proxies. So this all looks legit because we call to figure out, hey, that address is in fact pointing to this particular Windows file. So that, that all checks out. Step six, I got something of interest, right? I got a particular process, and this is 2940. I didn't call out dumping it. I'm going to grab the executable, and I'm going to thoroughly thrash it, right? Malware analysis, bring a malware table. Boom! Um, for some deeper explanation and uh, investigation here. So, that was any questions on the six step process? You feel like we tore into that machine? Interrogated yep. that thing. All right, so good job. Good job hanging in there with me. I'm going to introduce the PMAP acquisition suite. So far, we were using Recall. And if you remember that PMAP is part of Recall, we got Win PMAP, NodeSX PMAP, and Win PMAP. All three of these can do live analysis, which again makes it totally cool because I don't have to walk away with the memory now, bring it over to my forensics machine, and analyze. I can do immediate analysis right there. Uh, also, why it's being thrown into Gert. The default output right now is an AFF4. To explain the benefits of AFF4, because you're going to balk at this. You can't take an AFF4 and run it or uh, run it in volatility against it. You just can't. But you can extract the physical memory, the raw memory image, and check out the cheat sheet quite easily from an AFF4. The benefit of an AFF4 is adding stuff. You can add additional streams. So I can throw in the metadata. I can throw in the page file. I can walk away with this stuff. All I have to take from the machine is the AFF4. I can analyze it that on my forensics workstation. So it has some serious benefits, and uh, you know, there's some believers in it. What I'm showing you here is actually it uses uh, zip compression, so I'm listing the contents of the AFF4 with unzip, and then you can see what it contains. Uh, this is my Linux memory So quickly move on, so no one asks any questions about that. Uh, here's when Pima, I'm going to show you this. This is step one in live analysis. All you're doing is manually loading a driver. So of course, it's going to be a, an administrative command prompt, because I'm going to need admin privileges, but I load the driver and I love this, love this. It's showing you the memory ranges that are accessible for reading. What is that first 1,000 bytes? What what is going on there? It turns out the operating system upon boot up, if you have the BIOS password that you're entering, sometimes it'll get saved off in that first frame, we call it. So right now, the operating system can't see it once the operating system comes up. Um, and the memory manager, we're looking at physical memory through the eyes of the memory manager, that which the operating system can commit um, to, with the exception, First byte, those memory ranges that are assigned to physical devices. Right? Yeah, that was one thing one there. So step two, we'll move on. So I got my driver loaded. All I need to do now is point to that layer of abstraction. So understand this is not pointing to physical memory per se, but like a file that represents physical memory. So I got backslash, backslash, dot backslash, pmem, and I'm at the ready. I drop into that interactive session. So I can then go about thoroughly thrashing it on PS list, all of those steps that we were just going through. The last round now is something we just added to uh, when PMEM, actually recall, because we're in recall right now, is AFF4 acquired. So from a recall live analysis session, you can dump the memory. You don't have to back out and use when PMEM. They're really proud of that. Really, really proud of that. Um, so I'm supposed to demo now. How much time do I have? You have. About 20, well, about 15 minutes. You okay? Oh, yeah, I was laughing. <laughs> I wasn't joking. All right, so I will uh, put it out there. Who wants to see more windows or who wants to see a little live analysis with my map? <clears throat> live analysis with my map. You chose the hard one. <laughs> but luckily, I'm ready. I'm ready. Except for uh, font. Figure that out. So it's probably an interview. <coughs> we typically don't do many demos in uh, 
in our max. You know, it makes people jealous if they attend our class and they don't have a max. You know what I mean, right? So, so I totally don't want to do that. Um, I actually downloaded this. Um, I downloaded the zip file. I extracted it. I'm actually in my downloads directory, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I have root level privileges because I'm about to load a KEXT file, a KEXT, which is your kernel module on the OSX platform here. Do it, do it. It really is. Uh, and I've written my notes down just in case they got nervous here. Boom! That's all you have to do. What? Okay. Um, Getting too excited. Now, is it backslash? No, just dev pmem. And as long as I have internet access, like I said, I should be in there. I'm going to blame this on Michael if it doesn't work. Or the jealous vibes that I have going on in the room. She has a back and I'm so jealous. Sometimes it don't work the first time, you know? What do you, what do you think? Give it more time, Michael? Check connectivity. It's, it's pissed now. Not only a control C, but now I gotta go to the control and the Z. Well, forget you people that wanted me to demo on the, uh, on the Mac. We'll come back to that. Uh, yeah, I recently did a webcast where it was just that way. I was, I was doing a, a live memory dump. Got pissed at me. All right, Michael, can you see the font? All right, cool. Um, so I got this thing. I'm ready. Let's do the win PMM. Shut up. Um, so I'm going to load just like we saw in the slide, and then I'm going to drop back and apply this to employee investigations, and then wow you with the little Mimi cats, right? Who doesn't love Mimi cats? All right. So, so right now I've loaded the driver. Now all I have to do is call it. Windows backslashes PMM. And this happens to be my VM that is infected with XPatch. So if I did a PS list, that would be one thing. This is actually when it starts looking for the profile, is when, when you run PS list. So this is like the make or break moment here. And let's see if I actually have internet access. Man. You know how many times I tried? That's what it looks like when you're uh, when you're just totally screwed. <laughs> so yeah, there you are. Oh, I spelled it wrong that time. Nice. Maybe this will work better. If everyone everyone saw me today, like practicing practicing this over and over and over again, that's why. That's every single demo I do. So luckily I have a backup. I have an employee investigation uh, memory <laughs> image here that we're going to be playing around in the show. And uh, so right now it's in my cases directory. <laughs> And it's my, um, I guess if you don't have internet access, it's not going to work no matter what memory you're doing looking at. So we'll just cross our fingers. So is, is there really no way with recall to, to, to statically set the, the memory profile you're working with? Um, you can point it to the repository. It, it says it actually has hundreds of profiles, and that's the benefit. But yes, you can specify a profile. You can. It actually has that as one of the options. And sadly, sadly, uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't have their profile as little, which is another thing I was attempting to do. Hmm. Obviously, I have internet access. Yeah. Hmm. Right, I'll try one more time. Oh, no, I mean, I just loaded the page. Let's try again. I might have dropped off, right? Oh, 
Oh, no. That's just a low blow. I actually have my machine up and running. So we can do this. You're exactly right. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, my uh, DHCP lease must have expired. The things you cannot anticipate, or you can, and then you just suffer the consequences. All right. Go to my other one, and we can try this again. Oh, thank goodness, thank goodness. All right, I know. Seriously, it's just I needed to burn a couple minutes anyway, so that was just all planned. And I wanted you guys to feel like you helped me, because I, I wanted you to walk away with that feeling. So this is uh, an investigation that uh, we suspected. It's kind of a control scenario, but the student We suspected this guy was using a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing application. Um, and so we were doing a process list. First we did a memory dump, brought it back, did a process listing, and does anyone see it? I know, email! And my students are like, dude, that's old school. And I'm like, it's still alive and well, it's still kicking. All right, so the interesting thing about this, we did some of like uh, analysis of grants, persistence, mechanisms. One of them that you'd find is Microsoft Windows current version run, right? What's about that one as found in the software registry key? What about that one uh, kind of might give them a pass? If it's in a software registry registry hive, who does it apply to? Software registry hive will close the NT user that that so have these keys in them run indicating that the run is a value to get kicked off upon log on. But if it's a, if it's in the software registry hive, who does it affect? Everyone. Nice, everyone. So that turns out to be the case that upon a log on, it's actually kicking off. So if we were to do timeline analysis, you'd note that email quickly starts right after explorer. We got 22, 21, um, and what, 11 seconds? Uh, two seconds later, email starts, it's wrapping around. But, you know, so can you really prove that the user is making use of email? Maybe somebody else installed this, and now he's just a victim? How can we prove he's using it? You guys can probably think of a couple ways, right? Network connectivity. We can do a net scan. I'm going to show you these way because it's been a hard, hard day here. Um, I'm going to do handles. Handles are cool, right? So with handles, I can I can actually mm, further investigate a process to see what resources it's connecting to, like what files does it have a handle to? And this turns out to be pretty revealing. I'm going to add a couple filters when I'm running this. Handles, uh, pid equals, it's 1808. Uh, and it turns out to be object types. Because if I just did handles, dude, there's a ton of them. All of the things this particular process is uh, making reference to. So object types equals, and in quotes, because it's kind of picky about syntax, it's going to be a uh, file. So just show me the file handles that are associated with email. Now, what do you think? Do you think he was actively using this? <laughs> Definitely that. Because you see this 001 or 006 that part. We know with a peer to peer file sharing application, you get lots of different seeds pushing parts of the file uh, that you've asked to download, and that's just what's happening here. Uh, and it's all pointing to users like Lucas downloads email. You know, Sure enough, that is what I would write down for. At least one of those findings, network connectivity. What else would you look for? User assist, right? User assist, that's a plugin that's in recall. Uh, just showing evidence of execution, doing timeline analysis, so you can download or install it. Sweet, good job. All right, now I'm going to go back, do a little bit of hooking and jabbing here. I've loaded, yeah. Tempting fate. Forget it. I think I actually unloaded the driver. You guys are going to have this memorized. I know exactly what happened. I know where she failed. 
So if I do a PS list on my lab machine, this is actually working. Shout out to the person who called the internet as being the problem. Uh, in this case, I see I, the sticky knots.exe. Um, can I go after and get the contents of a sticky note? Which, you know it's pretty cool. Anyone know that song where the lyrics came from? No one's an Ed Sheeran, Sheeran fan. <laughs> Okay, so Justin Bieber is also one of my favorites. I would really want to go after this. Like, if I didn't, if I walked away with a memory image and I wasn't doing lab analysis, I'd, I'd be interested in what's in a sticky note because, you know, just like the old days when users would use leave sticky notes on your monitors with passwords, they're still doing this with text files, Excel spreadsheets. I'm always trying to grab credentials to make use of them later in my investigation. It pans out, it pans out. So how would I go about doing this? It's actually be a process. Step six was acquire notable findings. This is going to make use of memdump. Anyone heard of memdump? Yeah, memdump goes in and grabs all of the memory mapped, uh, say, physical memory that's associated with the process. So it dumps it out to a DMP file. It's excellent to run strings against. So I'm going to do just that. I know you're really worried for me. Um, I think it'll be okay. We're just going them dump pid equals and 4188, right? Didn't specify a dump directory, but it's working for me. All right, so you can see what's happening here. New wording of that. So it's taking a look at the virtual address space and mapping it back to physical memory. Let's get the job done. Almost like once you go, go, go. What we're going to end up with again is a dump file. I don't have to really wait for this to finish, but it did. Um, so that's good. That's good. Uh, the next thing I ran was Mark Sinovich's tool from System Internals, Strings, which is so much better than the Linux strings, right? Because it does ASCII, Unicode, Little Indian, Big Indian, boom! I got my strings.txt, and I actually I pre canned this, right? But you think, why didn't you prepare? Well, I kind of I did in some regards. I mean, because look, I then opened up that output, that text file, and I found the sticky note output. You're thinking, well, there was guilty knowledge involved. Can you be right? But we can totally look for things like the word password, like I did here, and we might run into something the user would save to their desktop. There's also a way to extract using dump files, the SNT file, which is the sticky note text file. So we can go in and just pull out that one file as opposed to doing an entire memory address space dump. But yeah, so there's a couple ways of doing it all using recall. And of course, you want to see the Mimi Cats, right? You totally want to, Mimi Cats, okay. So who wrote Mimi Cats? On the offensive side, we're a badass French. A French guy who's a badass? What? I know. Benjamin, Benjamin de P, right? Uh, he wrote Baby Cats and a couple people, he also, so he wrote on the offensive side, but then he wrote a Windows Debugger extension as a little gift to the blue team. You know, a little gift. Grace us with an extension. And that's pretty cool. Uh, Francesca Picasso uh, worked with the recall team and has actually imported this to recall. He's also responsible for the volatility plugin Baby Cats as well. So let's see what we got here. I know exactly what's going to have some interesting credentials, or at least some credentials. It doesn't work on every memory dump. It only works on some. Where does it pull the passwords out of? What process? LSAS. Yeah, LSAS process, right, right, right. So here we go. I got this thing. It's in the case directory. Um, All right, dropping in. I think I was just in there. Let's just run Mimi Cats. It is that easy. Let's see if there's anything interesting there uh, for our friends Mark Lucas. And his password is lame. But if you if you know if you've done pen tests, you want to aggregate these lame passwords so you can put them in your binding. And then for every day, you go suck, right? And all your employees suck. So uh, the blue team side of the house, I'm going to aggregate these credentials and use them if I ever run into a lame uh, password type in a zip file or true crypts. I mean, a true crypt password, I have some credentials that could be possible for password reuse. So that was the grand finale. 
I'm going to open it up for questions. Don't let one of your questions be why did your demos fail. I, really, I was merely showing my human side. And that's important, yeah, as a presenter. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, oh, all right, all right, sorry, sorry, sorry. You can take a picture of this. Thank you. I didn't return to my slide deck. I got really carried away here. Um, I will project this. And I think I have a couple uh, screenshots of the memory acquisition as well. So uh, in the slide deck. So if you hit that bit.ly link, you just saw where it, where it directs you to, the Dropbox. Uh, it is like five, forensic 526 resources. And you'll have all my presentations to include the one I didn't get to do today, the Plinko Persistence. I love persistence mechanisms. But recall is just so awesome. I wanted to share that with you today. Uh, you'll also get the cheat sheet. There. Thank you for reminding me. I want to share that. Anyone else? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, Noah, the fish file also contains a lot of memory information from scanning all the time. Do you pull that? The page file. The page file. The fish file. The fish file actually records all the information that's going on the computer at all times. So I would assume that would be in there. It is a very resource area. So yeah, it will be don't if you're smart enough, but it sounds like you are smart enough to go after that. I was like, I need to hit the books on that. Then you could extract it. Don't mention junk files. Don't files allow you to uh, isolate or identify the process um, address location of a particular um, file per object. And then extract it. So you can totally do that. Totally do that. Uh, recall is now throwing in, and now I'm reminding myself, it's throwing in the acquisition of page files, so you do that page file analysis too. So, uh, whatever it doesn't find in physical memory will actually go and bring it into the page file. Just to pull it. Let me go with you with the so you can tell me. I like that's what you do. Any, anyone else? Ah! Is uh, Lentimum architecture specific? Lentimum is specific for, uh, oh, I gave you a question. Here's the kernel version for it. And if you go through my cheat sheet, we actually still have to use PMEM in order to um, create the profile. So we still need the profile in order to understand and properly parse the memory image. Then PMEM works as long as the Proctocate port is available uh, and it will acquire it. It's the whole uh, grabbing that profile, which they haven't built yet. Uh, so I guess the answer is no, not yet. We still need the profile. Anyone else? Anyone else? All right, all right. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I still have posters up here. So if you want to have your friend this poster, uh, come up and grab one. There's more details in there. Thanks. Have a good afternoon.